This is White Sands Bay, one of the best beaches in Pembrokeshire and a top destination for visitors to St David's. But over a thousand years ago, this beach served a very different purpose. It was a stone-built chapel here, uh, which was then ruined by the year 1600. At the bottom of the archaeological deposit is a large stone wall that's probably pre 7th century. So between that and the 13th, 14th century chapel, there's a whole series of, of graves and other things. You can see just how close St Patrick's Chapel is to the sea, and the site is at considerable risk from coastal erosion. The Welsh Government, through CADU, provided funding for an initial phase of excavation to retrieve the most at-risk burials. We're back now in 2015 to continue with the excavation to ensure that no further archaeology is at risk from coastal erosion. Last year, 2014, we dealt with the immediate threat to the site. These are the burials which are being exposed and actually eroded. This year, we're doing a, a second strip a bit further inland, but still affected by erosion. But once we get down to the top of the archaeological deposits, uh, we treat everything very carefully. The first thing we do is we call everything by drawings, by photographs, written descriptions. Uh, so you build up a whole picture of the site, which you can then reconstruct back in the office. We're looking at quite a complex site because a number of different layers of activity have built up over time. In this trench here, we have a stone structure that's possibly a wall and that predates the burials that we've excavated so far. So what we're sitting on here is the earliest built structure of the site. It's made of these massive beach boulders and it's a wall which runs under everything else on the site. When this wall began to fall apart and sand built up against it, the kiss graves we have on this site were cut through it. And there's one behind me here which is cut right through the wall we know that some of the graves here date to the 7th or 8th century. So we have a really good example of a stone-lined kissed burial here. Stone-lined kissed burials were fairly common during the early medieval period in Wales. As a grave, it's actually quite compact. And what they'll have done is they'll have cut the grave and then lined the perimeter of the grave with these stone slabs. They'll have then have deposited the body and capped it with a series of fairly large flat stone slabs known as lintels. One of the things about this site which is perhaps unexpected is just how well preserved the human bone is. But here, because it's in windblown sand, it's very good preservation, which analysis you get an awful lot of information for the analysis of the bone which you can't do on a site where bones are not so well preserved. It really tells how the people were living, what their diet was, uh, what their age structure was. A huge amount of information we can obtain from this site. It does seem as though the latest use of the, of the cemetery site uh, was suited for children. Here we've got a really small kissed grave, very well constructed, the, the side slabs here, and beautifully covered on the top with a quite a large number of white quartz pebbles. It's actually the third grave found on this site that's been of a very young child and covered with these white quartz pebbles. So at the moment it's looking as if this was a, a treatment in burial of you know, young individuals that wasn't something that was going on for the adults on the site. One very nice one which had a, a cross-marked stone at the head of the grave, which is very unusual to find out. In fact, it's a unique find in it, to have a cross-marked stone with a kissed grave. And the whole series of other graves of, of similar date to those. OK, so we've got the burial of an infant lying on the back in a supine position. You can see that the arm here, this is the right arm, you've got the humerus, the upper arm here and then the lower arm, you've got the radius and the ulna. The ribs are clearly defined here and then running down those, the centre of those ribs you have, of course, the spine here. And then all of this, up the top area, this belongs to the skull and then the rest of the skull was actually removed yesterday. 
We have professional staff here from WD Agricultural Trust and from the University of Sheffield, but actually most of the actual excavation is done by local volunteers. And really without their enthusiasm and very hard work, we wouldn't be able to do this excavation. It's very important to have volunteers so that they can get involved in the project. The project then is able to move forward at a faster speed. We're not just having to dig holes. Um, we do get to look at the skeletons and go to help through the whole process. Reflecting on it, it's, it's wonderful that people will have come here looking for answers to questions. I'm probably going to leave with even more questions. I mean, there is so much history here and so little written that uh, it, 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 in a way, makes it much more interesting. At the moment, we haven't quite achieved what we hoped this year, simply because the site has been so much more complex than we envisage. So, at the end of this season, we'll then backfill the site, re-turf it over, and hopefully get some more funding for next year. All of the human remains removed from the site during the excavation have now been brought to the Osteology Laboratory at the University of Sheffield and the process of recording the remains can begin. This process begins initially by removing all of the bones from the box and laying out each skeleton one by one. The remains are recorded in terms of the presence or absence of different elements, um, how fragmented the actual skeleton is, how complete it is, and also the degree of erosion that has happened on the surface of the bones. And then the process moves on to then record, for instance, the age and the sex of the individual. The long bones, like this femur, are used for calculating stature. So we can also look at the chemical composition of the tooth enamel in order to determine whether or not the individual was local to the region where they were buried. And we can do this because during tooth formation, that is during childhood, oxygen and strontium from food and drink are incorporated into the enamel. But these isotopes give us a geological and a climatic signature. We can say whether these individuals were local to the area around St Patrick's Chapel or not. And if not, we can suggest possible places where they might actually have grown up. The study of cemetery sites like this and having the opportunity to handle the human remains means that we naturally reflect on who these people were and how they lived. By looking at the archaeological evidence, we can actually study the remains of those people that lived in the past and we can delve a bit further into the lives of all members of the society.